How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 in Pacific, 1 Eastern, Sundays with Andrew Zarian, and it is Wednesday here on the show. It is the first day of spring, believe it or not. Spring is here, which you uh, wouldn't have known if you uh, looked outside around here, but anyway, we got a lot to get into here today because it is Wednesday, and you know what that means. Although, obviously, the top story was something that I'm not sure anybody was expecting to happen today. But uh, we've got a settlement in the UFC lawsuit. And uh, we're going to talk about that today. And uh, as coincidence would have it, we have a former UFC fighter on staff, Filthy Tom Lawler. And uh, he's going to be on the show tomorrow afternoon, 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern. As of today, I don't think he knows anything. In fact, if you've gone online... If you've looked at the tweets from the fighters, like there's a lot of fighters just going, do I get anything? So uh, I think a lot of people don't know exactly what's going on right now, how much they're going to get out of this settlement. But uh, maybe he'll know more tomorrow. So Tom's going to be on the show tomorrow, and we will talk about this lawsuit and uh, and what it means. And we're going to talk more about that when we come back from the break. In addition to that, we've got AW Dynamite coming up tonight. It's the big show in Toronto. And uh, we, of course, have the I Quit match, Christian versus Adam Copeland for the TNT title and more. Also, Rampage immediately following Dynamite. It's three-hour block of AW tonight. We got lineups for a bunch of shows. If you want them, SmackDown, Raw, NXT already has six matches announced for next week's show. Got Stand and Deliver WrestleMania. We got Raw ratings and uh, all of the rest of the news, including a winner of the New Japan Cup. I was wrong. We'll see what that means. Plenty more. Back in a moment, Observer Live. special tour of Figure Four Weekly Headquarters, as promised. Today I will be accompanied by my assistant Vincenzo, so let's get moving. Hey, don't worry about it. Today's a special day, I'll drive. Today's going to be a good day, so let's not F anything up, okay? Now, I'd like to tell everybody, I just want to give a short speech on the way to uh, the compound here today, and that is that we are going through very tough economic times right now. Right, Vince? It's a time of uh, stock market crashing, the yen is devalued, a time of woe and want. and. Many of you watching this right now, for all I know, are unemployed. But the good thing is, and I always like to look on the bright side, as Vince is well aware, the good news is that for every dark cloud, there is a silver lining. And the silver lining is that Figure Four Weekly is doing great. It's a huge success right now. Subscriptions are up, quality is down, Profit margins are skyrocketing. Things are going very well. So, the one thing is that I don't want to make it seem like money is everything because money cannot buy happiness. But what it can buy is enormous houses. And that makes me happy. So, we will be going to see my enormous house, the Figure Four Weekly Compound. And uh, that's where we're heading right now.
Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. And the big story today, TKO, parent company of WWE and UFC, has agreed to a settlement in a pair of class action lawsuits that have been in process for a decade. Settlement that will see the former pay out $335 million to former fighters. News was revealed Wednesday via an SEC filing. Settlement for both Kung Lee and versus Zufa and Kajan Johnson versus Zufa came on March 13th and is a far cry from the $1.6 billion that was originally sought for by plaintiffs like Lee, Nate Quarry, uh, Nate Quarry Brandon Vera, Kyle Kingsbury, John Fitch, and others. Originally filed by Lee in 2014, antitrust suit included as many as 1,200 fighters that competed in the UFC at least once between December 16, 2010 and June 30, 2017, and did not opt out of the suit. They collectively sued the UFC for lost wages and back pay, claiming the UFC signed them into long-term agreements and then bought up all of their competition, stifling the market. Difference in the two cases is that while they are similar in nature, they came at different points in time, with the Johnson case coming after fighters had signed waivers against part of a, uh, being part of a class action lawsuit. Johnson case was also looking for injunctive relief in addition to damages, which would have changed how future contracts could be written. The Lee case was seeking just damages. How the money is distributed among the 1,200 fighters is unknown as of now. Industry reporter John Nash speculated there will likely almost be zero damages for Johnson because most signed class action waivers. The UFC announced that the $335 million will be paid out in installments over time and is likely to be tax deductible for TKO. After news of the lawsuit broke, TKO stock rose $5.00. 8609 as of this writing. And uh, there's more on the front page of WrestlingObserver.com. If you go to any of the MMA websites, you can read more. Now, here's my take on this. Are you ready? Yes. All right. So they threw around a lot of big numbers. $1.6 billion, triple damages, $5 billion. Remember these crazy numbers they were throwing around? Mm-hmm. And I asked this question a long time ago. And I'm not going to sit here and say I was right, but I asked the question, and now I think that I asked the right question. And the question is, okay, would I have liked Filthy Tom to have been paid more? Of course. Do I think all of these fighters deserve more? Of course. Okay? Did did UFC underpay them? Was that wrong of them? Were they Were they jerks to pay them as little as they did? Well, of course. Okay? However... This is a legal case, and we've been dealing with a lot of legal stuff of late, which has made some people very mad, but we're dealing with a legal issue here, okay? If I own a McDonald's, and the minimum wage is $15, and I hire a bunch of people, and I'm paying them 7 bucks an hour, under the table, hiring 8-year-olds, whatever... Okay, I'm breaking a lot of laws. What I'm doing is illegal, okay? In the case of UFC, they offered X amount of money to these fighters. The fighters agreed. They signed a contract. There is no minimum wage for fighters, okay? Is what they did illegal? Is it illegal to pay them what they paid these fighters. That was the question that I asked. It's not a question about was it was it like the right thing to do? Was it the nice thing to do? No. Were they were they jerks? The question is is it legal? Okay? And at the end of the day, when I look at what TKO paid out, 335 million, okay? And keep in mind, this is not 335 million for each of those lawsuits, this is $335 million total for both lawsuits, okay? What that tells me is that the belief was, from the fighter side, that I don't know if we're going to win this thing if this goes to court. And obviously, UFC didn't want it to go to court because they don't want all of this information there was a lot that was that already came out like a lot of text messages and you know a lot of i mean a lot of stuff came out they didn't want coming out and so so my guess is that at the end of the day 
You know, the fighter side figured, I don't think we're going to win this in court, but we settle, we can get a lot of money. You know, $335 million is still a lot of money. And, you know, TKO was happy to just get out of this with $335 million and not have to open up the books or whatever. And, uh, and I think that's what happened here. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, they can still pay fighters whatever they want. I mean, there was nothing that was ruled where, you know, you have to pay them X amount or whatever. So, you know, I would say that if I were a fighter, I would be quite disappointed in this. And the idea of, you know, everybody's going to get millions of dollars or whatever. I mean, I also don't know how everyone's going to get paid. Like, is is this going to be split equally? Is Filthy going to get the same payout as Conor McGregor? Is it some sort of, you know, if you were somebody that was paid more? I, I don't know how they did this is going to work. Nobody does. But at the end of the day, I mean, even if they split it like boom, 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 everyone gets the exact same amount. I mean, you're talking maybe 100,000, a couple hundred thousand per fighter. So they did not come out of this really as winners, I don't think. Well, you get a little over 200,000 or something. I'm terrible at math. I'm not going to ask you to do it because you're terrible as well, too. But that's without the lawyers taking their chunk off the top of this as well, too. You know, you got to factor that in. Um, we have to see, look, the, the, the answer is unionize. The answer is unionize and they're not going to because of promises where you could be Conor McGregor. You could make so much money in this that you could, you know, completely act a fool at any moment in time. And even he took on boxing Floyd Mayweather and doing other things to make more money because you are limited in what you're going to make in UFC. So it's either if it's not unionized, the only thing you can really do is get better representation and try to increase your star to a point where they need you in the same way that they need a John Jones or a Conor McGregor or a very, you know, handful of other people. That's about the best you can do at this point. And that's the same goes for WWE. Because in wrestling, the same thing goes. And there, I, to me, they have even more of a reason to do it now because you have agents, you have Endeavor that now owns this company. If now, and the way they look at things as being part sport and part entertainment venue... You can easily, to me right now, it would be probably the best time to unionize, but they won't because you can't get enough people to get on board, especially those at the tippy top that are benefiting from the system that's already in. So I don't know if there's a really ever going to be an answer to this because there never was an answer in boxing as well, too. And again, they're all from the same family tree. And I think the other issue on the fighter side is that at the end of the day, they were trying to argue that we were signed to these restrictive contracts, and then UFC bought all of these promotions, and they were a monopoly. And I think as we all know, I mean, that's pretty hard to argue that, like, if I left UFC, I couldn't fight anywhere. I mean, there were multiple organizations where you could go to, to fight. And, you know, some of these some of these people left UFC and, weighed, and made way more money in these other organizations. I mean, it's just... I don't think that they were confident in in their case going to court, and that's why they settled for, you know, a fraction of what people had suggested they were going to get out of this entire thing. That's the story. That's pretty much it. Uh, you we'll know, talk to we'll Tom see. about this tomorrow. Yeah, hopefully. It's been estimated about uh, one hundred ninety-five thousand. If they if they split it equally amongst all of the fighters. It would be one hundred ninety-five thousand. But is again, are we factoring in what the lawyers are going to take off the top? Of well, yeah, and we also don't know. Are, you can go ahead and take probably thirty percent of that and knock off thirty percent from there. Maybe you and you've go got taxes ahead. that you have to pay off that yeah, uh, settlement. And, so. and does D Dimitri or not Demetrius Johnson do Quarry and Lee and others? Will they get more of a lion's share because they have evidence of this or that or something like that? So. Yeah, it's going to be real interesting to see what filters down to everybody that's a part of this thing. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. How y'all doing? How are 
you doing? I'm excellent, Brene. I'm you excellent. Bet. Yep. Uh, very excited that you're able to join us here tonight. Congratulations on retaining the AEW World Championship in such an incredible match with Hangman Adam Page, Swerve Strickland. You guys beat the ever-loving hell out of each other. Should I ask you if you're even remotely surprised that you are still our champion tonight? Not at all. Um, you know, I've always made it a, a point to uh, you know tell the world what I'm going to do, and I think that I've delivered uh, on every uh, promise that I've made here in AEW. Uh, tonight was no different. You know, obviously, Swerve and Hangman, two tremendous young competitors, but they just didn't have enough, and I'm just that much better. So here I am, the champion. All right, guys, the floor is open to you guys. Any uh, questions you guys have for Samoa Joe? It's all you. Take the first one right here, Joe. Thanks for your time, Joe. My name is Jonathan McClarty from flagshipnews.com and militarynews.com. Uh, congratulations on your victory tonight. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Uh, what, do you, what do you think, you know, with Hangman and Swerve, Beefing with each other for so long, do you think that served as a distraction to, to further help you to retain tonight? Well, you know, first off, I want to thank your readers for their service. Secondly, um, you know, it was a huge mistake by both those gentlemen. I mean, obviously, they have very, very bad blood between each other. So, you know, these uh, heated issues can often boil over into other parts of their life. Unfortunately, it boiled over tonight, which is the worst place for it to happen. So, I mean, if uh, those gentlemen want to stay uh, eyes locked on each other, they thought that the path to salvation was through uh, each other's blood. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't because uh, I made sure that did not happen tonight. So, that's what I feel. Lyric Swinton, SNME Radio. So, you talked earlier a couple of weeks ago about bringing back the ranking system as a way to get the best opponents for the AEW World Championship. Today we saw an amazing match, one that you were a part of, and also Will Ospreay and Takeshita. What are your thoughts on the growing strong talent pool in All Elite Wrestling and what it means to be world champion during this time with so much talent? I mean, it's indicative of what AEW has always stood for. You know, we go out, we find the best wrestlers in the world, and we bring them together to find out who is the best wrestler in the world. Currently, that is me. But on my heels are some of the greatest grapplers to ever step foot in a ring. You know, when we have acquisitions, men like Will Ospreay, how can you not be excited about the future of this company? And, uh, you know, once again, we've set up a protocol. Will Osprey is new here. He's a fantastic, dynamic athlete, has had tremendous success everywhere he's been. But until he has that success here, I don't need to worry about him. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. And Mike, you yep. called it right. I did. And it turns out that uh, Yoda Suji won. Yes. He won. So now we have some interesting questions here, because this means it's Naito and Yota Suji coming up here in, in uh, just a few weeks. April 6th, Kura Genesis. Mm-hmm. And a week later... It is the Windy City Riot Show with John Moxley against Naito. So, remember a lot of people were saying, oh, you know, maybe the reason that uh, the BCC isn't in that tag tournament is because they don't want to beat Moxley. He's going to win the title from Naito. Well, now we got a lot of questions. Is 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 Suji going to win the title? If he wins the title, then Moxley and Naito is just a match. If he loses the title, then Naito and Moxley is a title match. Is Moxie going to win the title? What are they doing here? And I don't have an answer. And uh, we shall see. I don't know about Suji winning the title this early. I mean, he should, the, the funny thing is, like, he should have won it, like, last year when he was hot. Remember they had that match and it was like, why, Sonata, that, yeah. why didn't this guy beat Sonata? What's going on? 
Well, now Naito's a champion, probably for the last time, would be my guess. I could be wrong. Yeah. He's only had it for three months, two months, yeah, almost three months. And uh, are you really just going to have Suji just uh, win it here? Sakura Genesis, April 6th. Away we go. Is that is that what we're doing? I don't know. You can make a case for it, but they did nothing during their post-match today to indicate that they were adding drama into LIJ, who they are both a part of. Naito being the older guy who started it, or at least the Japan version of it, and Suji coming in from Mexico, where the roots of the, the group were from. They didn't do any of that. So do you on the six go ahead and have Naito do something heelish? outright heelish but feet on the ropes do something to get the victory and then start building suji and naito towards later in the year which gives you still your moxley naito iwgp world heavyweight championship match that i'm sure a lot of people in chicago are, are buying tickets for or that's one of the re main reasons they're going to that show you could could you look new japan could and i don't think for one second they are doing this you really want to do something big. I mean, have Suji win the belt, have him come over here, and have him beat Moxley on WrestleMania weekend. Do I think that'll happen? Absolutely not for some Well, I think reasons. it'll be absolutely not because they sold no. so many tickets for people to see Naito and Naito. John Moxley. You can't, you can't change that match. But here's the thing. If you still have Naito on that show or you make it a three-way with Suji or something like that, I think... You know, if you're New Japan, how, again, if you're going to move with Suji now, that would be a hell of a way to do it, to really establish this guy and say across the world on that weekend, you know, he defeated not only the guy he already beat for the belt, but then defeated John Moxley too, you know, one of the biggest stars in America. So I don't think any of that will happen, but I kind of would love to see that happen because I think Yoda Suji, he is not as hot as he was, but I don't think you're going to need – to pump a whole lot of air behind him before he heats back up again to that level in Japan. I, I think it's inevitable. It's just a matter of when this year he goes ahead and takes that title off of Naito, or maybe, I guess, January 4th, 2025. Well, we have Dynamite tonight and Rampage. No collision this weekend. We've got just Dynamite and Rampage back-to-back -back in a three-hour block. And we have Christian versus Adam Copeland. I quit match for the TNT title. And Copeland has basically said this is the culmination of a 40-year story. So I don't think we're going to have some wacky screw job or anything like that. They're think, not in the sixth inning? I think Copeland's winning this title and <laughs> sending everybody in Toronto home happy. Eddie Kingston versus Okada for the Continental title. Which, hey, we've been talking about this for a while. There's, there's a bunch of things happening. Eddie Kingston has three belts. He's putting one on the line here against Okada. He's putting the other on the line against Mark Briscoe at the Ring of Honor pay-per-view, the Ring of Honor title. And he, of course, would, you know, he's still got the New Japan Strong title as well. So what's happening here? Is Okada winning one belt tonight? Mark Briscoe's winning another belt at the pay-per-view? And Eddie Kingston will just have one title, and we have introduced again basically two more belts to the promotion? Or... Where do you get this other belt? I just don't understand Mike. This. Mike, listen. What? What? Okay. They've had the Ring of Honor title before. They've had the NJP. I know, but they, they put them all together. So one guy is walking around with three belts. Okay? Yeah, I know. So I know. when Eddie Kingston and, and Okada are on the show, there's only one belt. If Okada wins, there will now be an extra belt on the show. Okay? There's an extra added belt. Just and one, and if Mark Briscoe wins at the Ring of Honor pay-per-view and continues to wrestle on AEW television, there will be another extra belt. So if you're counting belts on the show, how many people have a belt? We're adding two by splitting up this title. Yes, That's what's we're, happening here. We're also dealing in hypotheticals here. And hypothetically, once that belt goes off of... Kingston and on to Okada, he then goes ahead and has that ROH shot with Mark Briscoe that he could lose to Mark Briscoe. And frankly, I would make Mark Briscoe the entire selling point. I would put on extra footage of him at the farm every week, extra promos. I would do everything possible to build up Honor Club and make Mark Briscoe that dude and only see him occasionally on Collision or, or That would Dynamite make me so sad. With that. I know it would, but like to me, I'm looking at this from a business, try to sell the damn thing because I'm sure they could use some subscribers 
go ahead and do that and then take the new japan strong title and lose it and get it the hell out of there that's what they should do the strong title should not be on tv unless it's building a forbidden door it's just not important to be there especially when you have a secondary group that you own in ring of honor and you've muddied the waters with that look i take that back you know what we are going to have an extra title on there because once queen Aminata goes ahead and wins this roh world women's television title tournament then she's probably going to have that belt on Rampage and on Dynamite and Collision, too. I'll bet she doesn't win. Who do you think it is? Well, it's it's her and uh, Billy Starks, right? Oh, yeah. It's down to and, her and, Billy. and Billy Starks. Yeah. Billy Starks was in the finals for the Ring of Honor title tournament, right? Yeah. And she lost. Yeah. Okay. And I've watched Tony Khan book for five years now. Mm-hmm. So I think that she lost that one and she's going to win this one. I could be wrong. I could be. I could you be could wrong because be, you've watched Tony's booking for the last five years and been baffled by it at points. Well, of late, I've been baffled point. by it. Of late, I have no idea what's going on. I used to be able to look at everything and didn't know exactly what was going on. Now I look at it and I'm wrong half the time, <laughs> and I don't know if that's good. I personally think it's bad. I don't know about the rest of you, but like that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's the that's the thing. You can be you can disagree with a story or a booking like. Everybody going, are you out of your mind last year? Why wasn't it Drew? Why wasn't it Sammy? Why wasn't it Cody? And that things have worked out that way. That That is undisputable. That things have worked out just fine. When it comes to AEW with some of the things they do, you come up with some things that seem to make a lot more sense. And then you watch their story and it either hits a wall, falls off a cliff. It rarely rises up and gets better and is better than probably what you were thinking in your own mind. Deanna and Thunder Rosa versus Tony Storm and Mariah May. Deanna and Thunder Rosa. Yeah. Who I think are supposed to be baby faces, but man, they're going to have a bad night. Hey, it's going to Th- be Geek City for those two. Thunder Rosa should be a baby face, but she can't, I guess, help, but I guess she wants to be a heel, but she should be a full blown baby face. Deanna Perrazzo should be a heel, and Tony and, and Tony and Mariah should be baby faces. Yes, I know. I know. Chris Jericho faces Hook. We will hear from Mercedes Monet. And then for the Rampage show, we have a tournament wild card match. Best Friends versus Kyle Fletcher and Powerhouse Hobbs. My guess is that uh, Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta win that one. And then the street fight with Statlander and Willow Nightingale versus Julia Hart and Sky Blue. Is God. tonight the night? That Julia Hart finally gets hurt for good? No, possibly. that Chris Statlander turns on Willow. Well, it's coming, guys. I shouldn't say that. In the old days, it would be coming. Now, I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I mean, for all I, for all I know, Sky Blue may turn babyface tonight. Who knows? But that's yeah, tonight. Right. That's tonight here on this program. Hmm. All right. Uh, Raw Monday. Actually, first we should talk about this. John Porco, who first joined WWE as a PR officer in 1999. Spent 24 years with the company. Hold titles such as Director of Live Events, Senior Director of Live Event Marketing, Senior President of Live Events, was promoted to Executive Vice President of Live Events. It's a lot of titles and a lot of words in those And he left. Which raises a lot of questions. Really? Well, yeah. Have you looked at their live event business? It's pretty good. Oh, my God. Go out on top, brother. I guess. Yeah. We don't know if he left or they fired him or I don't know what. He just left. Well, I, I presume he left. Yeah. But man, I maybe he did want to leave on top. I mean, he's been there since 99. I don't know how old the guy is. Sure. Parlay but that into something else golly. right now. Golly. Yeah. Plus, look, 25 years with one company. I mean, that's a long time. And granted, it'll be, a lot of people join that company really young. So I'll assume that he did. Maybe he did at 25 years old. He's 50 years old. He's probably got a good deal of money built up like go ahead and enjoy life or go ahead and try to find something that where you're working for yourself or doing something that you want to do every day but who Brandon knows? Thurston had a had a chart of like everything's doing and like these WWE live events are crushing Killing. dynamite television tapings collision I mean everything these house shows are doing ridiculous numbers and the TV like sell out sell out sell out sell out 12,000 13,000 per head merch yeah. Back in a moment, Observer Live.
Tell the people, Brian. Tell them. I tell them what I bought. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah, I bought a Finex cast iron skillet. And beautiful. it's the best thing I ever bought in my life. I've been cooking. You know, you know the pandemic was like absolutely horrible. But there was one good thing that came out of it for me. And that is that couldn't go anywhere. And so I just learned to cook. And I cook every meal now. And now that I've got this cast iron skillet. I love how you had to be in your 40s to actually make a meal for yourself. I made meals, but I'm talking cooking. I'm talking cooking. Searing them steaks on the... Oh, uh... man, it was sunny the last few days. We were barbecuing, pan frying these steaks. Mm. Oh, the stuff that I've been making. Yes, we have an air fryer as well. An air fryer. Do Do you have a Dutch oven? I had two barbecues, but... And I brought one back. Wait, two? Wait, did you? Now were they charcoal? Now you don't remember the barbecue story when I went to buy a grill and then oh, they yes. they mislabeled it, and so yes. I told them, and then they brought over a new grill, but they didn't take the other one back. So I had two grills, I had a free grill. <laughs> and after a while, I was just like, yeah, I'll take it back. I took it back. You do need to change over to charcoal, though. You desperately need to. Well, maybe that's someday. how you. That's when you really want to advance your your cooking skills. Let's see you out there with some some cherry wood and all that stuff, cooking up something there. Throwing the know. slats in there. Come on. All right, a couple of other uh a couple of other notes here. The raw rating, one point six nine million and eight point five five. So don't have hourly numbers yet, but I mean it's uh down four percent in viewers, one percent in eighteen to forty nine. I don't know how the Becky and, and Nia Jax held the audience. Uh, Nia Jax match held the audience, but it was fine. It was whatever. Then we had uh, the NXT show, and uh, Lance watched it. I don't know what he thought of it, but I think I know. But I will say this. I will say this about that uh, NXT show last night. Whatever you thought of the show, if you watched it, Perhaps you thought it was good. Perhaps you thought it was bad. Perhaps you thought it was great. Whatever you thought, it was way better than the last several weeks. I thought this show, by NXT standards of late, was good. Was it a good show overall? I don't know about that. But compared to like the last month or so, where it's just been like off the rails, I thought it was, I thought it was much better this week. So, a quick look. We'll do a full review Later on, Rodney B's show, Observer Radio, we had uh, Roxanne beating Tatum Paxley. So uh, she demanded a match against Lyra coming up at the pay-per-view, and Lyra gave it to her. They actually set up a lot of matches for the Stand and Deliver show. I could actually save a lot of time by uh, just going over the lineup for Stand and Deliver, because that's most of what they did last night. But we have Ilya Dragunov against Tony D for the NXT title. We have Lyra defending against Roxanne Perez. And quite frankly, Roxanne should win her belt back. Yeah. Unless she's going up to the main roster after WrestleMania. Which would be by far the superior option. But I don't know if they're going to do that yet. They're also giving Lyra the out, too. Because last night she came out in a sling, was knocked around by Roxanne, who put the arm bar on her. So they already kind of have this thing set up where Lyra can sell the injury and Roxanne can get the win. Trick Williams versus Carmelo Hayes. Still no stip. There's nothing. There's nothing. I think they got to add a stip to this match. I think so too. Whether it's lights out, loser leaves town, whatever. We have Braun Breaker and Baron Corbin defending the titles against the winners of the number one contenders tournament. And I think we've got a three way next week, if I recall correctly. And the winner of that match is going to get the title shot. And actually, I've got the full lineup here. Uh,. Well, we got the Wolf Dogs. Actually, we don't have that match next week. We have uh, Akir Tozawa and Otis facing Braun Breaker and Baron Corbin. And if they win, they get added to the title match at Stand and Deliver. I don't think that's going to happen, but we'll see. Carmelo and Trick Williams will be doing prime target vignettes. Elio will be facing Stax Lorenzo. Poor Stax. That brother. <laughs> Sean Spears faces Dijak. Josh Briggs versus Duke Hudson. And Thea Hale versus Jasmine Nix. Oh, man. Are they going to add Spears into the mix of that North American title match? Well, they, they, uh, I think they're doing for the North American title at the uh, 
stand and deliver. I'm pretty sure they're doing like a multi-person match of some sort. Well, because Ava said out. something to to uh, Duke about how you know I, I've had my eye on you and I got an idea and maybe it'll it'll uh, you know put you in contention for that North American title. So I think they're doing a multi man. I got be I like the idea of just the three of Obafemi, Brooks Jensen, and uh, Dijak together. I think that would be perfect. Although I guess to with the inexperience of both Jensen in multi-person matches and Obafemi just overall, you know, adding Sean Spears, I guess, would add some, you know, veteran presence and somebody else to help out in that match. And if you uh, if you've not watched the show yet, but you're planning on doing it, what I want you to do is this, okay? All right. I want you to watch Sol Ruka versus Brinley Reese. Okay. Yes. And then I want you to watch the uh, Gallows and Anderson versus Hank and Tank. Okay? Okay. Brother, two different businesses. Okay? <laughs> the the Sol Ruka Brindley Reese match. I mean, I'll make it clear. For what it was, it was fine. Okay? But it was two people that practiced a match move for move for maybe weeks, I don't even know how long, and they got on national television and they they did their routine that they practiced. They didn't mess anything up and and they they pulled it off. And you know, it was it was fine, but it was not like and it also was not Savage Steamboat, which also was a choreographed match, but there was like, you know, music between the notes, play to the crowd reactions etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean this was just like they may as well have done it in an empty building it was just move 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 finish that was it and uh you know i i, I bring it up because i think people will watch that match and go my god sol ruka she should be on the main roster now absolutely not no. neither of these two absolutely not and and honestly you know with tiffany everybody was raving about tiffany and she was not ready for the main roster either. No. She's not ready right now, but everything's fine. They're they're protecting her. They're 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 giving her specific spots to make her look good, but she's not at that level of working yet. And if you watch this Brindley Reese match, and then you watch the Hank and Tank match against Gallows and Anderson, I mean, let me tell you what Gallows and Anderson are not doing. They're not going down and practicing a match for two weeks with these two guys. No, and then. What they're doing, and you could see it, like you could watch it. I mean, they're screaming spots as they do this match. They they called most of the match in the ring. And you can watch these two matches, and it's just like, it's just hits you in the face. They're doing two totally different things. And this was great for Hank and Tank. You know, they got to be in there with a team that has been all over the world and wrestled everywhere, done everything, and they're in there trying to teach them how to call a match and work a match in the ring. And it was good. And then the Trick Williams, uh, you know, him and Noam Dar, I mean, it was the same thing, you know. Noam's another guy. They did not sit there and go over this match move for move. And I should note that when you watch Trick Williams in a match that has been choreographed from start to finish, it's very different. Then when you watch him in there with Noam Dar, and they're calling a fair amount of it in the ring. I mean, you can see he's not quite ready for the main roster yet. He's got everything when it comes to charisma. His promos are great. But in terms of on the main roster, show up at the building on Monday. Here's your match. You got two hours. Put it together. Go out there and do it live in front of two million people. 1.65 million people. You know, it's it's uh, he's not quite ready for that yet. So I hope he's not called up immediately, but we'll see. They don't need him to be called up immediately. That's the other thing is we still have Braun Breaker and Carmelo Hayes who have not broken out on the main roster yet because they haven't been actually fully called up yet. They got to get rid of the NXT stuff first, and then that leaves a huge hole in NXT that Trick Williams can continue to fill Frankly, until next WrestleMania, but I don't know if it's going to take that long for him to make his way up to the main roster. It will probably be the way things are going by Survivor Series. And uh, the rest of it was just normal, 
you know, setting up matches for the pay-per-view, setting up matches for next week. I mean, hey, you know, that's one thing you can say about, about NXT. When you watch the show, you know what's coming up at the pay-per-view, and you know what's coming up next week. Because all they do is matches and shoot angles for the next show. And that's why the show was better last night is because when you walk out of that show, you again, this is like WWE after three hours. The best thing that your audience can walk away with are the big points. You know, do they have the big things to carry with them? And did they come out of that, you know, positively? And I thought last night with NXT, they did. I think the last couple of weeks, especially because of Trick Williams, that has been the case. So, yeah, later on today, we'll talk about this show with Lance because he uh, he watched it. We'll get his thoughts. I don't think he liked it as much as me. Probably. But he hasn't been watching the show for the last month and a half. If he had, he'd have loved this show. <laughs> and by the way, you know who's a great tag team is Axiom and Nathan Frazier. Yeah, yes. Oh, my God. And I hope they don't break him up and have him feud. I, they are... I think that again, there's com. I think they're funny. I think they're talented. I like watching them work in the ring. I mean, I don't know if they'll ever make it to the main roster or not. I don't care if they can be really entertaining and put on great matches in NXT. I, they're almost a perfect opponent for anybody. Small guys. They have, you know, again, experience now. Nathan Frazier, a lot more experience than he had coming in as Ben Carter, and Axiom has been around for a while. They, to me, again, they fill the hole that Legato left and that other teams have left moving up to the main roster. Hey, don't forget, by the way, it's that time of year. F4W Observer Convention, Las Vegas, this May, Memorial Day weekend. F4Wonline.com slash Vegas. F4Wonline.com slash Vegas. May 24th through May 26th. And uh, while AW has not officially announced the Double or Nothing show, uh, I'm I'm... Pretty confident that uh, it's that weekend. What if they swerve you? What happens? Hey, well, that would suck. Part, party at but uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm 99.99 percent sure that that's where the show is going to be, and uh, I presume they're not going to announce it until after the April pay per view. Could be wrong, but that only gives them a month to really sell tickets, so they should do it. Like, how about tonight? Maybe <laughs> they they don't want to go head up with Podair Five. But if you want to go to the AW pay-per-view and you want to join us, we're going to have a an all-you-can-eat steak dinner at Texas Day Brazil, a meet-and-greet with, for the first time ever, Vinny and I. We're going to do a live Brian and Vinny show with a QA. and a you can, you can join us there for that. If you ever want to ask questions for the Facebook, but, like, you just can't because Granny won't friend you, well, now's your chance at this <laughs> Q&A. And uh, Sweet Party, details to come. Ed's Pro Wrestling Show, Annual Brunch of the Wicked Spoon, and brother, you're in Vegas all weekend. It's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. F4Wonline.com slash Vegas. That's what we're doing. Have you ever lost anybody out there? Any stories about that? Somebody. I almost lost Ed once. Unfortunately, we found him. Found him. (laughs) Back in a moment, because we're live. There's Joe, Rick Uchino, CagesideSeats.com. Congratulations on a great performance tonight. Just uh, wanted to get your thoughts on uh, your new number one contender uh, in Wardlow and the words he had this week where he said he was coming for your spot. Yeah, uh, and, and much like everybody else in this in this entire roster. I mean, it's no, it's no surprise Wardlow finds himself where he is. Obviously a very domineering individual that has had tremendous success, admittedly even against me. But uh, right now, this is a very different version of myself. This is not one that is distracted by other championship titles. I'm the AEW World Champion, and Wardlow will, look, will, will soon learn why that is. Hey, Joe, uh, DJ Danny Ocean, 101.9 KISS FM. Um, you mentioned Will Ospreay. We talked about Wardlow. Uh, is there any of these new up-and-coming guys you got your eye that you want to get in the ring with yourself that you want to defend your title against? You know, once again, I, I refer back to championship protocol. I mean, they have to earn this spot. I mean, this is not me up here picking out dream matches, trying to be nice about this. No, this is me uh, supporting the integrity of the championship that only the best grapplers in the world will compete for. So, uh, you know, is is there a a laundry list of wrestlers I'd be more than happy to take on in the ring? Yeah, every single one of them. And you look up and down our roster, you tell me one person that isn't a dream match. I know what this company is capable of. I know about the competitors in this company. And I am more than happy to prove each and every one of them that they're second tier and they're just not on my level.
Hey Joe, uh, Swerve made light of the uh, announcing in a poncho situation. Was mm -hmm. there ever a time in your life that you doubted that you would be back here where you are in this position? No, because obviously I was planning and taking the time to recover so that I could be back here at this capacity competing at this level. You know, far too, too many uh, uh, dumber athletes in this industry uh, don't take the time to heal. You know, don't bet on themselves and say, hey, listen, I'm going to step away from, from things a little bit and I'm going to come back um, uh, not 90%, not 80%, 110%. And I took that time and I came back 110%. Now I'm AEW world champion. So, I mean, th this is just indicative of me understanding what I need to do to get things done. You know, I'm, I'm playing this on a very different level than everybody else. Everybody else out here just hoping they get their shot, hoping they're doing things. I'm planning dynasties. And, I mean, it starts with, it starts with me. And that's not going to change anytime soon. I mean, they're, they're playing chess. They're, they're playing checkers. I'm out here playing chess. I mean, this is, it's a totally different game, man. And, uh, you know, that, that, that time, I mean, she, doing commentary and ponchos, I, I'm still a millionaire. You know, I know what he's talking about. You know, so, I mean, he, he may not like that issue, but, hey, that, that guy on the poncho just whipped his ass tonight and is still world champion. So, I mean, you, you tell me. You tell me who's running things around here. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. And yes, Lance Storm joining us in an hour. We'll be talking about uh, NXT, whatever else he's got on his mind. And it uh, should be a fun show. We did a survey recently. A lot of people wanted more Lance. So uh, we got to get him on here today. Don't tell him that, though. And, uh, I don't need his head to get any bigger. Mm -mm. You know how that guy is. Yeah. But anyway, Anybody that's ask for more me? Of course. Besides the YouTube chat. So uh, later on tonight, also Wrestling Observer Radio, myself and Dave Meltzer, we got a lot to talk about. The uh, NXT show, the AW show tonight in Toronto, and Rampage. God, I hope we can start before 3 a.m. tonight. Good luck. Got to watch. Oh, Lance is too late. He was listening. <laughs> Darn it. But anyway, uh, so yeah, tonight, Dave, and then uh, tomorrow will be the Brian and Vinny show talking AWNXT, all of these four subscribers at WrestlingObserver.com. And last night, the uh, the Brian and Vinny show, we uh, we talked WWF Challenge 1986. Jack Foley was on the show. A young mankind, essentially. And a lot of other wacky stuff as well. We got one more next week. And at the rate things are going, we may do another month of WWF Challenge. People have been having a good time with that one. And I can't get anyone to go with my idea of watching The Young and the Restless, a full month of that. Not seem to be going for it. You want to do it? All right. I'll do that one. Yeah. Hey, we're out of time, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.